Today, I am joined by Dr. Gary Habermas, and we're looking at some new evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. New evidence for the resurrection? That is brand new information! <laughs> I'll do that right okay. now. Bart Ehrman, best-known skeptic uh, in North America, probably in the world, uh, atheist New Testament scholar. Be careful what you say next, Gary, because we just happen to have Bart Ehrman right here with us to confirm or deny. I don't know what these people are thinking. It's time to fact check the minimal facts guy. Welcome to Apologia where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. As you may know, the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus is a prime interest of mine. So when I saw Gary Habermas, arguably the world's most renowned resurrection scholar, going live on YouTube to reveal to the public for the first time what he called brand new evidence for the resurrection, I just had to tune in. So let's just jump right in. Gary, where should we start? What's this new evidence that you've got? I'm so excited. Now, some of the things I'm talking about will be familiar to people, but I think it's the arrangement of them that's really new. Oh, so not new evidence, familiar evidence, but a new arrangement of familiar evidence? I mean, I guess that's still good. I'm a little disappointed. Now, as this was the first time Gary was giving this particular lecture. I don't know what this new evidence is. He's actually just going to reveal it here live on the streams. My first time hearing it. The flow of the presentation was understandably somewhat disjointed. I don't even know what he's talking about. So I'll be presenting the material somewhat reorganized by theme for the sake of brevity, clarity, and I think ultimately to steel man his points. But please check the original video for full context and to make sure I didn't misrepresent anything. There's five lines of evidence that all are manifest before, on or before 36 AD. All right, so Gary says he has five lines of resurrection evidence that he dates to 36 AD, or six years after the death of Jesus. The first stage is they preached it. The Coma Legia, what they preach is number one, and the message is always the same, deity, death, resurrection, because homologia means earliest thing we shared and believed among us. The earliest Christian preaching, according to skeptics, like Bart Ehrman and many others, the preaching of Christianity started immediately. I do think that that's true, but I probably mean it in a different way than Gary is using it. My hunch is that he thinks that that means that the third day on the Sunday after Jesus was killed, people started proclaiming the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection. And I don't mean it like that. I don't know when the disciples of Jesus first came to believe he was raised from the dead. They certainly did come to believe in it, and I think they believed in it fairly soon. I doubt if it was on the third day. It might have been you know, a week later, two weeks later, a month later. At some point, they came to think that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And they believe that, I think, because one or more of them had some kind of visionary experience. They thought they saw Jesus alive. Once they thought Jesus was alive, they told the others, and the others believed them. Uh, some of the others, and we don't know if all of the disciples even believed it. We don't know. We have all these stories, you know, in the New Testament of the disciples doubting. Why do you have all these stories about them doubting? Why don't they just believe it? Well, probably because some of them doubted it. <laughs> and so as soon as they thought Jesus was alive, they immediately assumed that God had raised him from the dead. They immediately then thought he really is the one chosen by God, and they had to figure out how it could be that the chosen one got crucified. And I think very soon they started thinking Jesus must have been a sacrifice of some kind. And once they thought that, I think, yeah, I think they started preaching that probably right away, wherever they were. My guess is they were up in Galilee at the time, and I don't think it was on the third day. Secondly, James is converted. James, the brother of Jesus, comes to know Jesus. From 1 Corinthians 15, we know he appeared to James, right? He appeared to Peter, to James. We have two individuals and three groups in that creed of 1 Corinthians 15. But all we have is that comment, he appeared to James. That's all we have in the New Testament. Now some fragments have been discovered. They're not New Testament. They're not inspired. But it's a little book that may only be 25 years after the Gospel of John. It's really early. And it's called the Gospel of the Hebrews. And it only exists in a few fragments. Guess what one of the fragments is? Jesus appearing to his brother, James. 
This is really cool. We know about the Gospel of the Hebrews. It shows up in the second in second century sources. We don't actually have the Gospel of the Hebrews. We have quotations of it by church fathers. If anybody's interested in it, I did a, I did a translation of it. It's in I've got a book of uh, Gospels that aren't in the New Testament, and we just have these fragments of the Gospel of the Hebrews, like we have the Gospel of the Ebionites, and so we have these various Gospels. We don't know much about the Gospel of the Hebrews. I don't think Gary wants to put too much weight on the Gospel of the Hebrews. If he's really talking about what I think he's talking about, the Gospel of the Hebrews has a very Gnostic orientation to it. And so if you credit it for some of its information that is satisfying to you, doesn't it mean you have to credit it with the other things it says about Jesus? You just can't pick and choose these things. It's like when people use Papias to show that Mark, who was writing down Peter's version of the story, yeah, well, they accept that little fragment from Papias. Why don't they accept the other fragments where he says things that even they say, yeah, oh boy, that's a little bit, <laughs> that's off the charts. <laughs> that can't be right. Gotta love a bloated, pus-filled, Thanksgiving Day parade-sized Judas. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you know, picking and choosing your evidence isn't really the best way to go. You really need <laughs> to, like, back things up and, and do a full study, so. Okay, number three, the preaching becomes crystallized. And... The crystallization is called creeds. We'll skip over Gary's extensive lesson about how creeds are bits of information worded in rhythmic patterns that through recitation and repetition, a general population will eventually commit to memory. Those are little statements that have a da 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 ring to them. And we do that so that potentially people who can't sign their name can't read are tracking with you. And focus on Gary's two contentions, that these creeds are from 36 AD or earlier, and that they contain high Christology. But the question is, how do we know they preach this heavy, heavy Christology from the beginning? Because the early creeds say so. And we know they're early. Critics date these things to the 30s. Critics do. Bart Ehrman, atheist New Testament scholar. Bart Ehrman says over and over and over that they're in the 30s. No! <laughs> Why do people say that? You know, I think I'll tell you why I think people say that. They say that because scholars have called those pre-Pauline creeds. And people reading that who aren't New Testament scholars don't seem to understand what that means. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they were creeds that were devised before Paul became a believer. Pre-Pauline creed means that they were creeds that were in circulation before Paul wrote them down in his letters. So if the letter to the Romans was written in whatever it was, 62, 63, 64, whatever it was, if you say that, say, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 to 4 was pre-Pauline, what you mean is that it, it was circulated before Paul wrote it in that letter. And so that could have been in the 50s. On what basis would people say that it was circulating in the 30s? According to um, Bart Ehrman, those, the, all the creeds si Paul cited could possibly have come could possibly have been in existence, Paul cites him as a Christian later, but they could have been in existence prior to his leaving home to walk to Jerusalem or ride or whatever he did to Jerusalem. I think they definitely were not. Okay. So I think he misunderstood me because I said pre-Pauline. That's what scholars call the... My first PhD seminar I took when I was a, actually a master's student, it was on creeds in the New Testament and how you identify them. And calling them pre-Pauline is just what people have done since the, I don't know, 30s or 40s. But it doesn't mean that they were around before Paul converted. It means they're before Paul wrote them. <laughs> Bart Ehrman says, the creeds, all, all or most of them originated in Jerusalem. No. <laughs> What, why would we think that? <laughs> well, because Gary just said that you think that. Well, I don't think that. I've never thought that. If I said it at some time, maybe I, I had too much to drink. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I, I've never thought that. So Gary ultimately fails to affirm his early dating, but he moves on to perhaps his most novel contention that whatever the dating, the pre-Pauline creeds contain high Christology. For those unfamiliar with this term, a low Christology would be to represent Jesus as someone who was nothing more than an ordinary human. Just a Galilean preacher who some people misunderstood, some people got him right, some got him wrong, some hated him, some loved him. He did a lot of miracles, he did exorcisms, and darn it, the Romans killed him. Whereas a high Christology would be representing Jesus as fully God. All right, dude, if you can show me that they thought he was pre-existent of the nature of God, 
and shared the throne with God, you're going to get my attention, and you're going to cause me to realize the earliest Christology, the highest Christology, but I don't see any evidence of this yet. I just hear you talking. Is that good? Yeah. Get on with it. And the critics agree where these creeds are. Another ad. I came here for the Bible stuff. So I've done this uh, six-lecture seminar on the book of Genesis, and I try to show how scholars have read the book in order to uh, demonstrate that it, it's not literally describing things that happened, but it's conveying very important stories uh, that were foundational for both the Jewish and Christian religions. But you're Bart Ehrman. Why would I go to an Old Testament seminar from the New Testament guy? Both my master's and my PhD were in New Testament, but my secondary field was Old Testament. I did my exams in Hebrew, and I have written books about the Old Testament, and I have, uh, I've taught the Old Testament at both Rutgers and uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So it's a secondary field for, my, for me. You wrote a book about how Jesus wasn't a myth. You probably think that Adam was a real guy too. In the book of Genesis, we have stories of, um, well, Adam and Eve. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> That'd be like four billion years ago. <laughs> and so it's like, it's a long time. This is a question that historians ask. And in my course, I talk about what is the evidence for somebody like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or these other patriarchs of Israel? Well, you wrote forged. Is Genesis forged too? One of my lectures is on who wrote who wrote Genesis and who wrote the entire Pentateuch. And I show why it, it could not have been Moses. Uh, and so it's related, but it's not the same thing because it's not a forgery because the author is not claiming to be Moses. Well, it's not written by Moses and we don't believe it. So who cares? The reason I left the faith, though, wasn't because of my understanding of the Bible at all. It was because of my wrestling with why there's suffering uh, in the world, uh, if there's a God who's in control. And like mo most books of the Bible, the author of Genesis is grappling with this issue. Why is it if God's in charge, is life so miserable? So I think it's really worthwhile reading a book like Genesis to help us think through these issues. You may not agree with the stories, but you you can see, you can see uh, what some of the answers are and it helps you develop your own thoughts about it. I guess that sounds pretty good, but what if I'm busy that day? It's being sold as a course. Uh, and so you don't have to be there. It is already recorded uh, and it is available uh, and you will be able to, uh, you'll be able to watch it whenever you want to. It's uh, six lectures, about 30 minutes each and watch them one at a time if you want. So there's plenty of time for you to do it. Well, all right, I'm in and I'll be helping Paul Gia's channel, which is cool. Heading over now to tinyurl.com slash bartgen, which is also probably linked in the description. And the critics agree where these creeds are. Here's one, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised from the dead, you'll be saved. And then Paul says, it's just like it says in the Old Testament, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that use of Lord, that second use of Lord is in caps. So if you have one of those Bibles where in the Old Testament, whenever it says the name Lord, it's all in caps, mm -hmm. that's Jehovah. Mm -hmm. If you confess through the mouth that Jesus is Lord, and it's like Paul saying, and by the way, by Lord, I mean Jehovah. No, 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 no. Paul did not think that Jesus was Yahweh. This idea is being, I don't know, it's being passed around the evangelical circles. And I think, oh my God, this is so wrong. Paul did not think Jesus was Yahweh. Look, you can't use this Joel thing. Paul didn't read it in Hebrew. <laughs> He's reading it in Greek. <laughs> it's kurios. <laughs> Jesus is kurios, and kurios said so, and so. No, you can't do that. The Philippians hymn in chapter 2 is quite clear. There is a God who is above Jesus. Jesus did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped after. But he emptied himself and became human. And after that, God highly exalted him and gave him the name. So God made Jesus his equal. So he was equal with God after God exalted him at the resurrection. But they are not identical. <laughs> He's not Yahweh. <laughs> and so, oh, man, I just think that uh, that whole idea. I, I never even heard of that until I was in a debate with a guy named Je with Justin Bass. And he. He was surprised. I didn't think Jesus was Yahweh. What? Jesus had never understood to be Yahweh. I mean, take the Old Testament. Psalm 110. Yahweh said to my Lord, to Adonai, sit at my right hand. And Christians took this as God speaking to Jesus. Yahweh spoke to my Lord. Well, then how is Jesus Yahweh? 
<laughs> and so he can't be Yahweh. It was never Yahweh in the early Christian thinking. That was, no. So it's right there. Here's some more. Philippians chapter 2, which is often called the Christological hymn. We are told that Jesus came from everlasting. He's preexistent. And at the beginning of uh, Philippians 2, 6 to 11, which is a creed, it says this, Jesus was in the form of God. In Greek, the primary meaning of form, morphe, is nature, the same nature of. And in Philippians chapter 2, 6 to 11, it starts out, he was in the form of God. Next verse, he was in the form of a servant. And that's where we get this God and man. You go, that's a pretty advanced doctrine, isn't it? So the word there is morphe. He's in the morphe to the, yeah, It means the form of God. <laughs> like we get the word morphology from it, for example. So it means that he was a divine being, just like angels and other supernatural beings are in the form of God. They're not God. They're in the form of God. Some scholars have thought that it's talking about Adam, like he's in the image of God. And I, I don't agree with that interpretation, but there's a kind of sense to it that Adam is in the image of God, but it doesn't make him God. Angels are in the form of God. It doesn't make him God. Later, Jesus is a divine figure of some kind, pre-exists. He comes down, becomes a, in the Philippians, him, becomes human. And then God, he rises from the dead. God exalts him up to his own level. That's an exaltation above where he was before. And he only gets there because God puts him there. It's Yahweh who puts him there. That's why every knee will bow to Jesus. In Isaiah, it says, every knee shall bow to Yahweh. Well, now they'll bow to Jesus, too, because Jesus now has been made equal with God. But he's not identical with God. To say he's identical with God is a heresy. It was a heresy in early Christianity. I don't know what these people are thinking. And these creeds are starting to pour out. And before Paul even takes his walk to Damascus of plus two or plus three, Paul knows all these creeds, and he is ticked because it's heresy but he meets the risen Jesus. That's step four. The blasphemy of Paul tells you what's uh, upset him is that they were calling a crucified man the Messiah. For Paul, that was ridiculous. You're saying that God chose a crucified criminal? And so that's what got Paul upset. Paul never says anything about the earliest Christians calling Jesus God, that that's what he was upset about. And so just read the passage. And the fifth one... Bart Ehrman says this may be the biggest argument in the early church for proving who Jesus is. Paul goes to Jerusalem. Do you remember Galatians chapter 1, which critics accept? Galatians is a book you can preach. Paul goes to Jerusalem, and he meets with, with Peter and James for 15 days. And, and Bart Ehrman asks the question, where do we get closer to the eyewitnesses than right here in that meeting? You know, historians, of course, want to get access to the best evidence they can. Eyewitness testimony is not infallible at all. <laughs> Their eyewitness testimony is problematic. But if you have a number of eyewitnesses talking about something and they basically agree without collaborating, well, that's pretty good evidence. And so that's the kind of thing you want. When it comes to the historical Jesus, how do we know that there was a historical Jesus? Well, uh, we don't have any author who knew Jesus, who's written for us, but Paul knew Jesus' brother. <laughs> and so if you're talking about, did Jesus exist? Well, you would think his brother would know. <laughs> uh, so that's what I mean. And Cephas, or Peter, is, was Jesus' closest disciple. And Paul personally knew both of these. And so this is my attack on people who are mythicists, who have claimed that Jesus never even existed. And this is one reason for thinking so, is because Paul knew people who knew Jesus. I mean, so it's as close as we get to an eyewitness saying. So when you said closer to the eyewitnesses, you meant eyewitnesses of historical Jesus. You didn't necessarily mean eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus. Uh, no, I don't mean that. I mean, I do think we do have an eyewitness to resurrection Jesus, Paul. Paul says he saw Jesus. So that would be an eyewitness. Now, whether he really saw Jesus, when, when an eyewitness goes on the stand in the courtroom, they get cross-examined. And often eyewitnesses will have seen things they didn't really see, or they'll say they saw things they didn't really see, or, they, or they'll mistake what they saw. And so they're still considered an eyewitness unless they're... But Paul says, and I think Paul really believes that he had a vision of Jesus. He saw Jesus. 
Paul could not have gone there, even the critics say this, Paul could not have gone there for 15 days and not discuss the gospel with the other two eyewitnesses. I mean, people infer that. Oh, they must have talked about what happened on Easter morning. I don't know what they talked about. What Paul says they talked about is whether it was legitimate to spread the gospel to the Gentiles without making them become Jews. He says nothing about them talking about what happened on the day of the resurrection. So you can infer that, but it's nothing I would ever say. It's not what Paul himself talks about. And that's step five. That's five. You put them all together, here's what you get again. Earliest preaching that was just hearsay for the time being, but it got started right at the beginning. Number two, James comes to the Lord by a resurrection appearance. Number three, the creeds begin, and they are bombastic. Jesus was existed before he was born. He received uh, eat, my, every knee will bow, every time will, tongue will confess. He was worshipped. He sat on the right hand of God. He shared the nature of God. Philippians 2, 6, Hebrews 1, 3. He shared the nature of God. These things were bombastic. Paul hated them, and that's why he was imprisoning them. Number three, in, in response to the creeds, Paul takes off to Jerusalem. I'm sorry, Damascus, and he meets the risen Jesus. That's four. And five, three years later, he confirms this message with Peter and James, the eyewitnesses. I agree with points number one and two. There was early preaching, and I think James probably did convert before 36. He certainly did. Uh, so that's, that part's right. The other three don't hold water historically. Formalized creeds, there's no evidence of formalized creeds before 36. What would be the evidence? The creeds we have are in Greek. There's something to suggest that Romans 1, 3, and 4 was maybe an original Aramaic composition, but it doesn't have a high Christology. <laughs> it's the whole point. It has an adoptionist Christology. The earliest creedal material in Acts all has adoptionist Christologies, which means that Christ wasn't God. He was made into a divine being. And you get that in Romans 1, 3, and 4, which is probably the oldest of these creeds. And so, you know, there is zero evidence for creeds before 36. One of the others was uh, early preaching that uh, was blasphemous to Paul. That is right, there was, but it's nothing to do with Jesus being God. I forget what the fifth thing was. That Paul met with Peter and James to confirm the resurrection. No, it doesn't say anything about that. So he's just making, look, it's just making stuff up. I'm doing five here, but I still haven't answered this question. Where was the fuse that shot this all out, all five of these? How did they come shooting out of the cannon at one time? I got to still answer that. The answer is the resurrection. They heard these things before Jesus died, but they didn't realize them till he was raised from the dead. And that's when the wick was lit, when he was raised. And that's why the Christology was so explosive right from the very beginning. That's why the earliest Christology was the highest Christology. Does that make sense? I'm not going to grant those things. If I were to grant those things, I would say, why does that show resurrection really happen? What it shows is that people really believed the resurrection happened. How do you get from people believing it to it actually happening? Even if people were calling Jesus God in the sense that Gary means in, say, the year 35, why would that mean that the resurrection literally had to happen? It means they believed it happened. And I do think they believed it happened. That has no bearing on whether it happened or not. I know people who believe, I literally know people who believe that the earth is hollow, but it doesn't mean that the earth is hollow. <laughs> <laughs> I know people who believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven. Like, suppose they believed it within three years of his death. Does that mean it really happened? Is that how we do history? I think the resurrection is a belief, and I have no qualms with people believing in the resurrection because it's a religious belief. But don't, don't tell me it's history. <laughs> you do not establish miracles on historical grounds. And so if you pretend you do, you don't understand what history is. And the reason you won't get a job in the history department in a university is not because they're biased against believers. There are plenty of believers who teach in history departments in the universities, but they don't claim that miracles can be established historically. What do you think about those five as being shot out of the cannon? And, I mean, you said you've been anticipating this for a long time. We didn't unpack oh, yeah. as much as we could have, but uh, there are these kind of, I mean, they're not proof, but are they so, kind of stunning in how they all fit together? Yes. Yeah, so I, I my assessment off the cuff of what I just heard and still processing it, obviously, I've got to like, it's going to take some time to really think about it clearly. If you're a resurrection affirming Christian watching this, what I think you should be stunned at is how each and every time that Gary used Dr. Ehrman as his source, that he was wrong. Dr. Ehrman doesn't hold any of the positions specifically attributed to him. 
And every time Gary interpreted scripture, it was ignoring obvious refutations to his non-standard assertions. If my YouTube channel takes the time to check the primary sources, I'd expect this world-famous scholar to get his facts straight before publicly declaring that he found new evidence for anything. If you prefer to spend your time learning from a scholar like Dr. Bart Ehrman, why not sign up right now for the first part in his new How Scholars Read the Bible series called History, Legend, or Myth in Genesis. It promises to be the scholarly, intellectually honest, theological opposite of Ken Ham, Kent Hovind, and the rest of the Young Earth crowd we often cover here. Check it out by going to tinyurl.com slash bartgen, B-A-R-T-G-E-N, and you'll be directly helping this channel and the Apologia mission. If you'd like to see more of my analysis of the resurrection scholarship of Gary Habermas, tap on the video on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later. Later.